lovers of horror, connoisseurs of violence, and and much gore galore. Uh, I'm Sam. And I'm Evan. We're the Horror Appraisal. We've got another great episode for you today. Who we got on today? Well, today we're actually doing an interview with a director from a film we uh, reviewed a few months ago. A uh, really cool found footage film, uh, The Upper Footage. Yeah. Uh, and today with us we have Mr. Justin Cole, writer and director of that film. Hey. Hi, guys. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> Not much. Just yeah. here uh, hanging out with you guys. Cool. Um, so first, right off, tell us a little bit about you. There's not a whole lot really online. Tell us what you do. What got you into filmmaking? Um, the reason that there's not much out there is because I really I haven't done much. Um, this was my first feature. Um, I come from I actually was in acting school for a while, and when it was time to get out of acting school, I was offered a bunch of roles and stuff that I wasn't very excited about. So the illusion of being an actor kind of uh, showed itself. It, was, um, it wasn't playing uh, Marlon Brando-esque roles. It was dressing up as a pirate and <laughs> acting like an idiot and doing stupid stuff. So I wasn't too excited about having a career in acting. So I went to uh, film school and I actually did a uh, short program and I was going to go to a uh, four-year program and I left. Uh, before I went to a four-year program, I just said, screw it, why, if I'm paying this much, why don't I just make my own film? Right. And that was kind of the, uh, the start of my idea for the upper footage. I had a couple ideas in my head. It was the one that I thought I could most realistically do with a limited budget, and um, I just went for it. Nice, man. So you feel like you get more control that way then, huh? Yeah, it was just like... I got into acting because I, I was an athlete before and I played hockey my whole life. And when that wasn't gonna work out, I got into acting and like the idea of acting was really cool to me. But the reality of acting is so far away from that that I was, uh, I was a bit disenchanted with the whole situation. And I already invested so much of <laughs> time into learning how to become an actor that I was like, uh, Let's see, like, my dream was always to become a director in my 40s, kind of like a Clint Eastwood kind of thing, like just trek along and learn yeah. uh, from others, other directors. And I just got to the point where I was like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna have to have some balls or I'm gonna be a 40-year-old soap actor. So, uh, <laughs> so I just said, <laughs> screw it, and I went for it. Okay, first real question. Uh, we really enjoyed the upper footage. Um, it was really effective, like a lot of other found footage films. Um, well, you enjoyed it more than uh, Evan did. Well, you know that, that that's a little true. Uh, if you're gonna call me out on that, um, <laughs> this is really into it. However, you know, I, I as a film, you know, I, I I do definitely respect what you did, and I'll get into some of that with you know the, kind of the questions I want to ask you. Um, I, it was very it didn't underwhelm me or anything it was just very after watching this film it's almost kind of like it, it took away it almost wants to take away part of your humanity you know because of, of the way people act in it and you really are left thinking could people really react to those circumstances in the way that they did so i i don't want to say that i didn't you know appreciate your film especially uh right in front of you but uh <laughs> i did I, I did respect your film um i, I definitely am i'm definitely glad that we watched it so. well it's not exactly enjoyable and i did it sure that myself it's not sure. a, it's draining it's not something where you're like oh wow i love that was just great <laughs> well that's that's why we say it's effective you know it does that to you it, it elicits a response nobody enjoys cannibal holocaust but they admit that that's like a really nasty film and it affects you that's why it's been successful yeah uh, but I was going to ask, what kind of films have been most effective to you as far as a filmmaker? Um, for me, film, as I've gotten older and as I started getting into the acting world, so to speak, kind of lost its magic. Like when I was younger, like watching a film, I felt like it was almost real, even though you know, of course, it's not real, but you, I was able to empathize with characters a lot more than I am now. Right. And now when I see a lot of films, I'm just like looking at like, lighting and set and oh i wonder how many takes this took and that guy <laughs> right? is mailing it in he doesn't care he's doing it for a paycheck <laughs> and like that magic is gone and the the peak of that magic for me was blair witch project sure. i remember being a kid my mom wouldn't let me see it. it was like if you you watch it you're not sleeping in my room tonight that's <laughs> on you you have to deal with consequences 
And I remember I got it from Blockbuster. I put it in the VCR tape. I sat there in a room by myself in my boxers, this close to my TV. And I was just like, holy shit, <laughs> like what I'm watching. <laughs> and like that, that magic. <laughs> <is>. <laughs> That's that a, magic now is completely gone. That's a that's a very dated story, by the way. Blockbuster and VCR. <laughs> yeah. um, but, <laughs> I'm dating myself. Yeah, I, I but, shaved my head so you don't see my gray hairs. <laughs> and I'm just telling everybody how but, old I am. Minor, pre yeah. minor present. But you know, for this movie, you know the the subject matter you know you chose was a social class that you know many people you know pretty much detest. You know, the, kind of the upper one percent. Um, what inspired you to choose this kind of social setting to tell a story? Um, it, it's weird. Uh, like I said, growing up, I played hockey, and most of my time spent on all my weekends. I really didn't have a social life. I was traveling to small towns throughout the uh, country, essentially, and just chasing my dream. So I, I wasn't out there partying, doing drugs, or anything of that nature. But when I went to college, I winded up hanging out in the city more. I lived right outside of New York City. And my first girlfriend was actually a girl whose father was a, uh, a, a I believe he was the CEO of some Fortune 500 company. Her, her mother was a fashion designer. And I went from kind of just being around athletes my whole life to being around kids that were having sex and doing drugs since they were 11. And it was kind of a world that was like, woo, holy shit, like this exists. It was <laughs> yeah. like very very odd for me, but being that I was still an athlete, I wasn't partaking in excessive drug use or uh, drinking like crazy. Um, so I kind of just bear witness to this whole situation as kind of an observer. And I've always been a storyteller. Like I, I've always been kind of a closet creative even before I got into uh, filmmaking and acting. Yeah. So I, I felt like there was like a reason I was witnessing it. And it was... Like, as time went on, a lot of media such as Gossip Girl, and there was a show NYC Prep, and there was, like, all these shows, it seemed, there was, I don't know the years exactly, but that lifestyle was glamorized in the media, P Paris Hilton, you name it, uh. from every scope of media was glamorized, and I saw how disgusting it was. Like, I could go on for hours about girls who were showing up to brunches with billionaires, and the night before, they were banging two guys in a Starbucks bathroom. Like, it was they just this, to exist. Yeah, they don't show that. They don't show the real side of this stuff. And they glamorize this stuff that's kind of gross. Like, and media does that a lot. Like, you don't see cocaine use the way that cocaine use in real life looks. Like, in media and in a lot of films, it looks glamorous and beautiful. And it's always... The, the best looking women and Leonardo DiCaprio with his beautiful <laughs> hair is snorting cocaine off the most beautiful woman. And then it's really like some preppy kid who looks uh, pink faced, yeah. racial slurs the whole night, yeah. slobbering, has saliva on his face, mucus is running because <laughs> your nasal, nasal cavity is loose. <laughs> It's uh, it's a whole different experience that's never shown, and it's kind of something that I wanted to show in a realistic way, and that's why it's not that endearing or cool. pleasurable it's, in many ways. It's definitely realistic. I mean, I work in substance abuse, so I see people all the time, and it it was kind of like, oh, this is like watching work. <laughs> <laughs> um, going with the POV style, the found footage style, as a first-time director, um, it seems to be a good way to go as far as budget's concerned. Uh, what do you see yourself doing next? Would you like to go with something more feature type, like a lot more camera angles and stuff? Yeah, yeah, this is probably my last found footage film ever. First and um, last? <laughs> yeah, it is my first and last. Um, it was uh, something that not only the way that I shot it, it allowed me that possibility to push something in a way that was real, mm -hmm. that I think was it, like... I feel like a lot of problems with independent filmmakers, and I've been around independent filmmakers for essentially the past 10, 12 years of my life, is that there's that like complaint. It's that underdog status and the complaint that you're an underdog. And like, no, we can't get huge budgets to make films. We can't get A-list actors. But what can we do to kind of bridge that gap as much as we possibly can to make something that's unique and stands on its own? And I didn't want to do something that was uh, an imitation or something else because I know if I imitated something, 
just budget wise, I can never be as good. Right. So it'd always be second class. So this is something that I thought it wouldn't have mattered if I had a $10 million budget. This is the way I would want it to look and this is the way I wanted it to feel. And um, it was kind of that, that all along, it's like found footage is not something that I'm in, in love with it and I don't want to do anymore. It's not, to be honest, horror as a genre is not something that like I think a lot of my films in the future are going to be. It's my next one's going to be as traditional camera wise as, as possible. <laughs> cool. <laughs> cool. How did it feel writing characters who like, can so They're dehumanize so a victim? I mean, do you, do you think that, um, realistically, you know, people can do this as, as easily as the characters do in your film? Yeah, um, and that's twofold. It's not only the people that I knew in those situations who I would see be completely brutally, vi uh, like, not brutally violent physically, but absolutely horrible to people just if they thought they flirted with somebody's girlfriend or if they gave them the wrong look or if they were in the wrong social circle. And then combined with that, if you look at the more extreme examples such as I mean, back in the 80s, the NYC Preppy Killer, mm -hmm. and more recently, Jordan Vandersloot and yeah. Nan uh, Natalie Holloway, where these guys see these women, and once they're done having sex with them, if something happens to them, they're like, oh no, my, my fuck toy is done. I'm going to throw her out as if she's a napkin. Huh. And it's that like horrible slice of humanity that you don't really get to see in media or in films, I feel a lot of the time, because yeah. when you see someone like Jordan Vandersloot or with the NYC Preppy Killer, these guys had a female legion of fans because right. they're handsome and when you see them, they're dressed well, they're going into a courtroom, they're uh, like, they're, you could put them on a TV show like by the way they look. So people don't see them when they're pink faced and red and just, throwing a girl in an ocean or leaving a girl dead on a park bench. And it's like, I feel like if you saw that, there would never be people that would empathize with them in any way. Exactly. And I, I, I kind of, with this, I wanted to show like, no, this is the decision-making process towards people who don't look at others as having an equal value. They're, they're garbage. And um, I mean, I feel in media all the time that is propagated. Like I just saw something the other day with a Tim McGraw at a concert. I oh was, yeah, he uh, bitch slapped somebody. Yeah, and for me, like <laughs> when I saw that, it like it really bothered me because like when you watch the video, he's dancing and everyone else is dancing, and it's almost like he's like, hey, we're all together, we're all having a good time, and then somebody touches him and he's like. Wow, <laughs> you peasant, you think you're one of me? Like, oh and the illusion just goes, bam, it's gone. The illusion's up. And, like, he profits off this illusion that we're all in this together having a party, but, like, you so much as touch him. He's like, no, 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 no. The curtain lifts, and he slaps a woman in the face. And that just wow. oh, gives me, like, a feeling in my stomach that's just, like... I haven't seen that. <laughs> oh, it's gross. Like, it's just so gross. And I yeah. just feel like you see that in a lot of places. You know, the one thing about horror horror actors and directors and stuff, like, if you meet people at conventions, they're so personable, it's crazy like that. Yeah. Just I think uh, people that are used to, like, the kind of climbing up and clawing their way, um, they're used to kind of interacting with fans and not seeing them as something that's far away from them because they're not really that far away from reality themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, did you ask the last one? I know you did. Um, you know, you've actually, I had a question ready for you, but, you know, I've, I've got to be honest with you, you've really kind of answered it. <laughs> and, and many of the answers you've already given us, just uh, very insightful answers. And the question that I was kind of thinking was, you know, how did you intend uh, your film to be social com commentary on, like, the decadence of society? But, you know, like I said, you've, you've really done a great job actually answering that uh, so far in, in everything that we've asked you. Um, so I'll just kind of let you go with that. <laughs> so. it, well, for me, it was just, it, it was, it's almost like, what I just said, and that's like a new yeah. example. If it's like this, almost like this girl gets to be around these people for that one night. Yeah. And it's an illusion that she's part of it. She, right. it's, it's an illusion. And it's uh, one of those things. It's like a lot of people aspire to something that is so far away that seems more tangible. 
I think, and the way that a lot of things in society are set up is it's to give you this illusion that that carrot is right in front of your face, and then you notice it's kind of it's, it's not the even rabbit with you, the line. You can never the, quite get to it. In the line, and yeah. it's like da da da. <laughs> um, you released the teaser footage very early, two thousand nine ish, right? Correct. Uh, yeah. Um, the uh, what was the timeline of production like? Was all of it shot then, or was that just kind of like? to get interest before you did the main shots or uh everything was shot by the time we put out anything but the uh what took so long in post-production is being a first-time filmmaker i thought okay we're gonna shoot all this stuff and then we're gonna just sit down edit it and it's gonna be brilliant right off the bat <laughs> yeah. and we're gonna get the perfect edit and the problem with that was our first edit was so bad it wasn't even funny. It was, I think, I, I don't even remember how long it was. I think it clocked in at about three and a half hours. And it was so long, and it was so rough, and it was just like, I looked at it, and I was like, I know there's a good movie in here. I know what I want <laughs> is in here, but I have no idea how to get to there. I had no idea. And it was really, from there, we had the footage of the overdose, and we were kind of like, are people gonna buy this? Are people gonna think it's real? Because I thought it was real. And everyone on production was like, this looks super real. But until you put it out there with people that aren't biased, you have no idea. If people are, you're gonna put that up and people are gonna go, bullshit, this is a movie. And it's kind of like, it almost added, a, it almost gave a huge boost of confidence to us that what we were doing, even though what we currently had was so rough, uh, was good is when we put it out there and everyone bought it hook, line, and sinker. Like, yeah. people were going crazy over the video. So we were like, yeah, we made this realistic film yeah. that, um, that like, if we're able to build the shell around this overdose scene, so to speak, we'll have something here. And um, I went through about four or five editors uh, and then I just winded up locking myself in an apartment for about two, three months and I taught myself how to edit because I was like, I couldn't get the cut that I wanted to. And then the final edit was an edit that I made. And then I, after showing it to people, I've edited it. I've edited it since it's been on Vimeo. I've, I've done edits because I just watch it. And like there are parts that I see some criticism that's just just like, I hate your movie, this is the worst <laughs> fucking thing ever, and th that stuff's really not helpful, but so, I've so also why? seen people that are like, this is, this, <laughs> this is a great, th this is great, but some parts about it, like I think this part, I think this, and then sometimes I'll see something and I'll agree with it, and I'll go, oh, this person makes a point, it's kind of something I was thinking that I didn't follow through on, so, um, uh, that that stuff has been really awesome as far cool. as like retaining control of the film because mm -hmm. it's kind of been able to I've been able to evolve with it and make it sharper and make it better and make it make the points some some of my make sure that the points I'm trying to get across with it actually are communicated to other people instead of just being something of my own that's like oh I get that like I want to make sure that people that see it understand it gotcha cool. right on one question that you know I've, I've always kind of wanted to ask somebody who uh, has directed films is really it's kind of a generic question but it's just it's always interesting to me is what films like even you can be as specific as you'd like what films inspired you to direct you know whether it be genre or actually just specific films actually um as far as that goes and this is really weird in general mm -hmm. I don't like movies I just don't don't like them like because uh, for for me um like if i'm gonna sit down and watch something like if i'm just thinking about like performances and stuff of that nature and i can't like really feel something i i kind of get a little uh, i'm just not as emotionally invested like i watch like a lot of mma like i watch a lot of fighting i still watch a lot of hockey and like for me like watching mma is like the pinnacle of like an emotional connection because you're seeing two people and the rest of their lives will change based on the events of the next 15 minutes and like that gravity of a situation is just like ooh like like you empathize with those people like you're just uh, like at least me I'm like oh my god like that guy can wind up ruining the rest of his life in the next 15 minutes or 
making the dreams come true of not only himself and his family. Right. And that kind of stuff is just like, whoa, like, like that's, that, that's strong. And as far as films go, like films that make me think I love, mm -hmm. like it was after this film that was made that I like some of my favorite examples actually are films that I've seen recently. Like I recently saw her and I loved it. I thought it was brilliant. Um, last night I actually saw an older film that I never watched that I can't believe I took so long to watch was World's Greatest Dad. Mm -hmm. I've seen that. Have you guys seen that? I saw that. I have not. I saw that. Robin Williams, right? Yeah. Yeah, that and was that was a cool movie. It was so unbelievably uncomfortable. Absolutely. That happens around the midpoint that mm -hmm. almost had me, I never cry during movies because I know they're not real. Right. But it had me as close as I could get and <laughs> I was just, it it handles subjects. Yeah. It handles subjects as as death and um and uh, what you call it misconceptions in sure. such a powerful way that I feel that it's something that will stick in your brain mm -hmm. in real life uh, real life applications like there's a sliver of me no matter how small that will look at the world slightly different for watching that film and I feel like films like that like are what is great about film like I, agree. I will my Completely. perception will be slightly changed like that uh, I'm not gonna watch a movie and I won't make a movie where somebody sits down and is like oh wow Justin made Justin Cole made a great movie my life's completely changed but like I would like to like, <laughs> at, 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 I would like to at least like change perception of somebody just a sliver sure. and I talked about this recently it's like if I'm gonna make a film I'm gonna take at least two years of my life out to make it mm -hmm. and People are going to sit down for about 90 minutes and watch it. Right. And if that's the only thing that they get out of that, I just gave two years of my life to give somebody 90 minutes. It doesn't feel like a fair trade. And yeah. it kind of feels like I just was like, okay, guys, like here, like, oh, did you have fun? And maybe I'm, maybe it's my, I'm kind of, maybe it's my naivete as a filmmaker that, because as like a, when you get up the ranks, it's about making money. It's not about making a 90 minutes that will stick with people. It's, it's, like, your, it's a bunch of work for money. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I've already had opportunities in my younger life to make money doing things that I hated. So I'm completely aware that I never want to do that again. <laughs> and that's something I've kind of been lucky with. Cool. <laughs> that I've, I've experienced that and I rather make less money and do stuff that I love than make more money and do stuff that I hate. Yeah. And, uh, that's kind of, uh, where I'm at with it. And that's like stuff like that. Like that's why I hope with the upper footage and that's awesome. Like when I saw your guys review of it mm -hmm. and even though, um, you didn't like it as much as you did, <laughs> yeah. um, you were still able sure. to talk about it and have yeah. a conversation. Absolutely. With, yeah, which which I loved. Like I, I was just like that's someone who wasn't like, it, oh wow, it, like you watched it twice, yeah, and you were able to have a conversation. It it elicit. It, it was something that was able to elicit an emotional response if you conversely talked about it with somebody. <laughs> so, I mean, that's and and I do I did really appreciate that about yeah. this film. We had, we had a little less on screen charisma then too. Yeah, it was very late at well, night. And we, <laughs> <laughs> it was very early for us. Yeah, but but that to me is. Awesome. It doesn't matter if you like. It, it's almost weird. It doesn't matter if you love it or you hate it. It's sure. A conversation is born out of it. And that, to be honest with you, I thought it was cooler that you had conflicting visions of the film, so to speak, and yet you were still able to have a conversation. Uh, I think a more fruitful conversation than if both of you liked it at the same level. I, I agree. Yeah. We have a lot of those kind of things where, yeah. <laughs> uh, like gutter balls, I love that he hated it. There's some other things that are, that are out there that just kind of we conflict a little bit, but it's fun that way, you yeah. know? I think it's so much better, and I think that's cool. Like, I think, and you brought up uh, some points about the film that I never brought up as with the blur face that was really cool that you were placing other people's face there. And I think that's such, like, a neat way to look at the film that I never thought of, and it was just awesome seeing someone's interpretation that something I never meant that yeah. could be super powerful and poignant that I never thought of. And that was like really neat. Cause it's like, what does, this is what this means to me, but what does it mean to other people? Right. And to see something so different from what I even imagined was really awesome. 
Well, I mean, I'm glad you enjoyed our review. That's that's pretty yeah. cool. Uh, we don't usually get to hear from the from the makers themselves. No. Um, so you, you mentioned that you don't really plan on doing a whole lot of horror, but I'm going to ask you something horror related. If you get the chance to be in a horror film sometime, and somebody says you're going to get killed, deader than shit, how do you want to go? <laughs> oh, if you have a choice, how do I want to go? I want to go as unrealistically awesome. as possible. <laughs> That's a great because answer. The more realistic, the more nightmares, and the more I'll probably think about my my imminent demise. Cool. So, awesome. uh, I would like a spaceship, maybe aliens, a werewolf, awesome. like something as ridiculous as possible. So I can't. So I can't be walking home one night and go like, "Holy shit, I'm going to get hit by a car like I did in the movie." I've seen this happen I'll be before. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> one, you know, one thing, you know, we're, we're kind of wrapping things up. You know, we want to make sure that people are aware of your film and uh, that they have the opportunity to see it. So I, we definitely wanted to ask you kind of here at the end, you know, tell us, you know, where, where can people see the upper footage? How can they view it? It's available on um, Vimeo uh, On Demand. Um, the link is Vimeo on demand, uh, Vimeo.com slash On Demand slash The Upper Footage. But if... Uh, you don't want to type all that in. We're on Twitter, um, Twitter slash the upper footage, Facebook slash the upper footage. Our website's release the upper footage, uh, dot com, and all the links are available there. And um, we are on Vimeo, which is compatible with all TVs, computers, and devices. Um, it's pretty much like any other video on demand service. And um, hopefully soon we're in talks with getting in more uh, mainstream. Uh, on-demand formats cool. currently, so very cool. Hopefully, right. we'll be more places soon. Hope to see you on Netflix or something. It'd be cool for you. Yeah, yeah, I would love to be on Netflix. Like that's the for us, that's the golden standard. Like the more people that could see it, th the better. And I would Netflix would be awesome. <laughs> right on. Well, I mean, that's that's pretty much all we got to ask you. Is there anything that you would like to put out there uh, that people should know? Maybe that you haven't said that we haven't at thought to ask uh no i think you guys kind of pretty much covered everything pretty well cool. I, I think you guys did a great job at your questions oh, I can't thanks man <laughs> all right man all well, right. thank you for doing us the favor of coming on and talking to yeah, us it was great talking thanks to you man thank you sir all right see you later justin see you later bye justin peace <laughs> well that was awesome that was awesome